Hello, Lighthouse Fort George. My name is Dan. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, again, not uh, the way it's planned. My kids have COVID. Uh, Nikki and I have tested negative, but uh, uh, my kids got it, and I've been advised that it is best for me to stay away uh, in the small chance that I could be contagious in spite of not having any symptoms. So I miss you guys. I look forward to being with you guys this next week. Our quarantine should be up on Wednesday of this week, and so Hopefully, uh, service as usual the week after that. Thanks for being here today. Uh, just as we get started, uh, I want to let you know that we are going to be doing communion together at the end of the service today. And so uh, if you are online joining us, go ahead and grab your uh, bread and some juice or wine, something so that you can participate at the end of the sermon. Uh, if you are at Lighthouse, we're going to do communion as usual in our interactive worship, uh, and so uh, don't worry about that. Um, and if you are at Fort George on Sunday morning, then uh, uh, you should have received one of these little communion packages uh, when you came in. If you didn't get one of those and you want one, put your hand up, and one of the ushers will bring those to you now. Would you pray with me as we come before God's Word uh, and uh, look forward to Him speaking into our lives? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that uh, you are present, uh, uh, even in this crazy world of technology that we live in where I'm up uh, on a screen. Uh, this isn't our plan, but Lord, you're sovereign and you're in control of all of this, and we are encouraged by that fact. Uh, we, th we know that you're present with us as we gather in your name, and so we revel in that, Lord Jesus. And we ask that uh, even now as we come before your word, that you would fill this place and move in our hearts and transform us. I pray for teachable spirits in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in 1992, uh, Disney's Aladdin came out, and I remember watching it for the very first time, uh, being scared of Jafar and also just wishing that I had a lamp. As a 12-year-old, my dreams were pretty tame. Uh, the genie was pretty specific that there was no more wishing for more wishes or anything like that. And so what did I want? Well, I wanted to be the biggest kid in class instead of the shortest, you know, strong and, and good-looking, good at sports, all that kind of thing. That's the first thing. Of course, uh, going along with that, uh, the girls would be interested in me. I was interested in that. And then, you know, hey, uh, a pile of money would be a plus two, like maybe, I don't know, a thousand dollars. I couldn't imagine anything more than that. Oh, how life would have been amazing for this 12-year-old if I had that lamp. Well, I'm not 12 anymore, but I still wouldn't mind finding that lamp, right? Uh, and here's the crazy thing, you know, uh, I still want all the same things. Uh, just the difference is that my 40-year-old uh, self wants them bigger than my 12-year-old self did. So assuming that the genie says you can't wish for more wishes and uh, uh, world peace and uh, the er eradication of COVID isn't within uh, his uh, jurisdiction, and what would you wish for if you found that lamp? Well, if you're new with us today, we're walking through the Gospel of Mark, and uh, we're in a section I've titled, On the Way, and this is where Jesus tells his followers, hey, I'm going to the cross, uh, and if you're going to be my disciple, then your job is to pick up your cross and follow me. And that was a tough sales pitch. 2,000 years ago, just like it is today. But Jesus' promise in all of this is actually, as counterintuitive as it sounds, it's actually in following him to the cross that we find the abundant life that we all desire. I mean, Aladdin's lamp, eat your heart out. The desire of our hearts, Jesus says. We get that as we follow him to the cross. Now, in chapter 10, uh, where we are today, it deals with uh, three major categories of life that Jesus wants us to follow in Him, uh, follow Him in. And uh, the first is marriage, and then it's might or power, and then money. Uh, and today we're going to look at the first of those three sections, which means uh, you've shown up on Marriage and Sexuality Sunday. Woohoo! Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. If you've got a Bible with you, uh, would you grab it and uh, stand up with me? As we come before God's word, we're in Mark chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and sit down. Wow. So Jesus is teaching and the Pharisees try to trip him up with this hot button topic of the year. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, you might think, hey, sounds like a fair question. You know, Jesus teaches theology. It's a theological question. You know, marriage and sexuality is a big topic in the Bible. Uh, The Bible uh, does say all sorts of stuff about this, including uh, in Deuteronomy 24, where Moses told Israel that divorce was possible if your spouse uh, did something displeasing. But actually, this wasn't a theological question. There were two camps of opinion on this, uh, a liberal one and a conservative one. There's no NDP or green in the first century. But because the liberals and conservatives were sparring over this topic, sparring here, uh, it would have been a little bit like if you asked Jesus this question. So Jesus, what's your stance on the vaccine? Right? Like, are you pro-vaccine and therefore opposed to freedom and and choice? Or are you anti-vaccine and therefore ignorant and selfish? It's a controversial topic. So what was the debate? Well, the liberals had taken Moses' word displeasing, and they interpreted it to mean just anything at all. And so actually there's a historian who found an ancient document from the first century where someone argued that because his wife had burnt his breakfast, he was entitled to divorce her. She displeased him. Well, the conservatives saw things a bit differently, and so they interpreted the word displeasing as referring specifically to sexual immorality. And so if your uh, spouse cheated on you, then that's what displeasing meant, and that was the only grounds for divorce. Now, the Pharisees were actually pretty sure Jesus was going to side with them on this one. They were the conservatives, but they had no love for Jesus. They didn't want him on their side. Actually, this is a trap, and you see... Herod was actually king in this area uh, at this time. And if you remember back to chapter 6 in Mark, he's the guy who chopped John the Baptist's head off. Now why? Well, it's because John called him out when Herod divorced his wife in order to marry his brother's wife. And so Herod uh, locked him up, threw a dance party, and the winner got John's head on a platter. At least that's sort of how it happened. Well, this is actually what the Pharisees are hoping for. So they know Jesus doesn't like divorce. And so they hope he's actually going to incriminate himself and lose his head. The problem is you simply can't get up early enough in the morning to pull the wool over the eyes of the guy who made the morning. And they had just no idea what Jesus was actually about. You see, Jesus wasn't a liberal or a conservative. He lived for God's glory. He's on God's team. And so Jesus doesn't answer the Pharisees' question the way they're expecting. But he doesn't do it because it's actually the wrong question. It assumes something about marriage and sexuality that Jesus just fundamentally disagrees with. Now, I'm going to speak carefully here because uh, this is still an incredibly touchy topic. But it's in the text, so we got to deal with it. At our church, what we do is we just walk straight through the text. We, we deal with everything that's in there, and we take this as God's word to us. So Canada's about as liberal as, uh, on marriage and sexuality as Rome was in the first century. Very, very similar. There's nothing that we do that they weren't doing back then. Now, they didn't have the same language that we have when it comes to, you know, gender fluidity and sexual expression. They didn't talk about being trans or gay marriage. But all these things were embraced by society. That was Rome. 
fairly liberal. Well, on the same time, there were also conservative pockets in Rome, like the Pharisees, and and they held just incredibly different beliefs than culture in large. And so as a result, just like today, there was conflict. And so the liberals back then uh, believed, you know, hey, you know, sex is uh, fun. It should be practiced any way you want. And uh, relationships like marriage, they're fine, but, you know, just a bit idealistic. And so if yours didn't work out, well, you just get a divorce. Conservatives, on the other hand, you know, believe that the traditional family should be defended, uh, that sex should be reserved for marriage, that divorce should only happen in matters of infidelity. And, and guess what? Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. These are still the exact same positions that the liberals and the conservatives have, and you probably lean one way or the other. But here's the interesting thing. That's conviction and belief. But when you look at how these specific issues, are, how specific issues within this topic actually play themselves out practically, say divorce and sex outside of marriage, then the lines between the liberals and conservatives actually grow gray in praxis, you know, like we actually live them out. And so, uh, first of all, just everybody agrees that marriage is hard today, right? So full of sacrifice, it often doesn't live up to people's expectations. That's, a, that's kind of a, a general position, at least among married people. And I actually heard a child ask his dad what marriage was, and he responded, marriage is like going to the ice cream stand every day, but you're restricting yourself to only choose vanilla. Wow, there's, there's pain there. Now, statistically, uh, there is actually less divorce among church attenders than culture as a whole. And so the stat I came up with, it's an American stat, but it said uh, 41% of first marriages and 60% of second marriages end in divorce. That's in culture as a whole, but among regular church attenders, only 35% of marriages actually end in divorce. And so that's a little bit encouraging. Something's going on here. But what's less encouraging is that among people who get divorced, uh, whether they're a liberal or conservative or non-religious or religious, the reason for divorce that they give is identical. And so in Canada, the predominant reason given when filing for divorce is irreconcilable difference. So just two people who just can't get along. Practically then, these lines, what you believe about marriage, liberal and conservative, they they turn gray. That's divorce. Well, what about sex? Well, a couple of uh, years back, Pew Research, which is a Christian research company, conducted a study in which they found that the majority of Christians, so 57% of Christians, say that sex between unmarried adults uh, in a committed relationship is sometimes or always acceptable. Now, again, this is lower than culture as a whole, but still significant. And what this means is that when it comes to practically living these things out, so beliefs about marriage and sexuality are a little different than actually how it turns out practically. Uh, Liberals and conservatives have different beliefs, but but often live things out very, very similar. And Christians, like ourselves, uh, think that, you know, sex and marriage are private aspects of our life, and, and really, religion shouldn't speak into them, or maybe it doesn't have anything to say, you know? What God thinks on these topics is, is a bit irrelevant in 2021. That might have worked fine uh, way back in the Middle Ages, but today it's archaic uh, or maybe even abusive. Well, for what it's worth, Jesus disagrees. Jesus thinks actually that God's views on this topic are not only relevant to 2021, but actually the path to the best marriage and the best sex that exists. Look how Jesus responds. So in verse three, he asked the Pharisees, what did Moses command? And they responded, Moses permitted a man and, uh, to write his wife a certificate of divorce. That's right out of Deuteronomy 24. And Jesus says, you know, okay, yes, uh, divorce is in the Bible, but actually all sorts of stuff's in the Bible that God doesn't like. And and so Moses' words here about divorce aren't actually uh, showing us anything about God's heart for us. 
They actually show us about our hearts. Our hearts are hard. That's what what Jesus says. And, And then Jesus actually just cranks things way up to another level. And so he says this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. In other words, don't even think that you can jump out of an unhappy marriage into something else. You can't. Every way out of marriage involves sin. In uh, Mark, this is where the story ends, but in Matthew, we get a few more details and the disciples say like, whoa, right? If if that's true, if, if there's no way out, then it's better not to get married at all. And actually, Jesus agrees with them. He says this, you know, yes, some people should stay single. Some people should stay single. For, for some people, it's better or easier to follow God as a single person. That's in Matthew 19. Now, I wish I could camp there for a bit, but here's all I've got to say today on this. If you're single, all right, if you're single, there is a ton of gospel or good news directed to you. Uh, and uh, it's possible, not only possible, and in some ways it's easier to reflect God's image as a single person than as a married person. And so if you're single and and you want to get married, the Bible says, go for it, pursue it, but pursue it Jesus style. But on the other hand, if you aren't feeling the pull to get married, it's not bad. Pursue being single, but do it Jesus style. You see, Jesus was single and he didn't miss out on anything. I'm gonna leave that there because today's text is about marriage and sex. And there's actually some great news here from Jesus that lies outside both the conservative and the liberal camps, but we have to trust Jesus in order to get it. Do you trust Jesus when it comes to matters of marriage and your sexuality? Well, in church, almost everyone trusts Jesus for salvation right? I mean, if we look around here, I think that's a fairly safe bet to say. But when it comes to issues like marriage and sex, the the stats seem to imply that we aren't sure we want to trust them when we practically work this out. So Jesus is our ticket to heaven, yes, but when it comes to modern living, if we want our happiness, really we're the ones who know best. We're better off on our own. So imagine that Nikki and I went on vacation and we said to our parents, you know, uh, hey guys, uh, take our kids. We're going to leave them here with you guys. We love these kids like crazy, but we trust you with their lives. Actually, we've done this and it's great to get away. But then imagine that at the same time, we locked everything of value up in our house. So we don't have a ton, maybe like our our $250 worth of jewelry and our $50 Earl's GC. We put all these things in a safe and locked it up and said, you know, mom and dad, we don't trust you with this stuff. Would that be ridiculous? Would it be ridiculous to trust them with something of most importance and then not trust them with something small? Well, when we do this with Jesus... When we trust him with our salvation, but not with our marriage and our sexuality, we got this kind of an issue. So we want the perks of being with Jesus, but we don't want to actually follow him. But Jesus isn't interested in having that kind of relationship with us. He's going to be God in our lives, or he won't have anything to do with us at all. And that's because he built this place. He he knows how it works. And he believes, Jesus believes that him being our God is actually best for him as well as good for us. It's his glory and our good. And this is where Jesus leads us in the topic of marriage and sex. And so he says this then in verses six to eight. God made them male and female. From the beginning of creation, and this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So Jesus says, you know, okay, if you're asking uh, what factors constitute favorable divorce or, or forgivable divorce, you can get out of it like that, then you're asking the wrong questions. I don't, I don't want you to avoid divorce. God's not up in heaven saying, you know, stay married. I want you to be miserable. Oh, and and by the way, while you're at it, save all your sex for your miserable marriage too. 
No! God loves you. He, he, wants you uh, he wants for you the joy of being joined to someone and united as one. He wants this because a great marriage actually pictures him. In Ephesians, uh, Paul concludes his section on husbands and wives and how they're supposed to act, saying, this is a great mystery, but marriage is actually an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This is actually about God. You think this is about each other, you know, men and women and all that kind of stuff? It is that, but actually that's just an illustration. The point is, if you do this right, if you do marriage right, it's going to be awesome because it's a picture of the way God relates with his people. So how does God relate to his people? Well, he makes a covenant with us. Like marriage, he says, I'm going to be your God and you will be my people. And then he's faithful to that covenant while we screw up and mess up and fall short. And God's response is to, love it, is to leave heaven, to put his skin in the game, actually, and to take the punishment of our unfaithfulness upon himself. That's what Jesus did. And he did this because he wasn't looking for a way to divorce you. God wasn't trying to find a way to divorce you. In fact, he wanted to find a way to bring you back to the abundant relationship that he wanted you for in the beginning, that he created you for in the beginning. Do you know that God created you in order to have a relationship with him? That's incredible. He wasn't looking for a way to get rid of you. He wanted that back. He wanted you to be what he created you to be. And his hope is that in this, in doing this, you're going to actually be blown away by his love for you. That, that he would go to these incredibly extreme ends and that you'd fall in love with him in return. Friends, everyone wants to be loved like that. We all want someone who's going to cover our faults and, and love us even though we aren't as good as we present ourselves to be. Right? That's the story of Aladdin, Remember? He's this uh, street rat who falls in with the princess. She loves him for, he wants her to love him for who he is, but he puts all this mask and stuff on in front of him. We want people to love us for who we are, not who we pretend to be. But hold on, you say. Disney's a pipe dream for 10-year-old girls. And that's not reality. Of course that, that happens in the movies, but that's not the way it works. We live in a broken world where people are selfish and, and divorce just happens here, all right? And sex is, is fun on the other hand, and so don't restrict yourself to vanilla ice cream. You got, you got to get what you want while you can because that's all there is. Is that your view of marriage and sexuality? It certainly was the defeatist view of the Pharisees, and, and it's prevalent in Canada. We're a bunch of realists running around. But friends, this is not Jesus' view. This is not what Jesus thinks about marriage and sex. Jesus believed marriage and sex was awesome because it's a picture of God's love for the world. And Jesus thinks God's love for the world is awesome. Second thing Jesus says here has to do with sex in general. And so when Jesus quotes Genesis saying the two will become one flesh, the picture here is of a union between a man and a woman uh, that's sexual, emotional, and spiritual. It's a whole being thing. To be one flesh means to be united, seeking the good of the other in every aspect of life. That's what it means to be one flesh. That's what we do with our own flesh, right? We, we seek the good of ourself in every aspect. We seek our pleasure and our joy and, and, our, and our health and, our, and everything that's good. That, and so that's what it means to be one flesh with another person, to seek their good in every aspect of life. And Jesus says marriage is the context where this happens. It doesn't happen anywhere else. It only happens in marriage. Now, that's offensive in Canada, to say that marriage, and specifically between a man and a woman, is the only place this happens? The reality is that most Canadians don't agree with this. And guess what? It was offensive 2,000 years ago too. Nobody in Jesus' audience agreed either. 
But Jesus was never bothered when people didn't agree. His desire is to direct us to God's abundant life. He wants this for us, and He wants us to trust Him in this. But He'll never force it on us. Love never forces, but it calls us to trust. So the other day I was driving my kids to McDonald's and there's this chorus of backseat drivers from, you know, way back in the minivan. And so they're saying, you know, hey, dad, uh, is the speed limit really 60 here? And uh, dad, did you signal when you changed lanes? And dad, are you going to stop at that red light? And, and, and my response, you know, I'm listening to this go on and I say like, no, I'm not going to stop at that red light. That's somebody else's red light. And oh, by the way, you know, you guys are uh, sitting two rows back without any training, any experience, not even an ability to see over the dash, your opinion about how to drive doesn't matter. You need to trust that I know what I'm doing and that I'm going to get you safely to your chicken McNuggets. And Jesus says the same thing. I know how sex work. I, I, I built it and I want the best for you. I don't want you just to simply survive in your relationships, right? Not getting divorced until you die of old age. That's not the goal. I want you to win. I want your relationships to be full of the same kind of love that I have for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the kind of love that I want you to enjoy. And that's what sex is about. Well, how? I mean, why only in marriage? Well, here it is. In our world, sex is about pleasure. But Jesus says God designed sex to be about becoming one flesh. And this includes pleasure, but it's, but it's bigger than that. You see, if our sexuality is going to resemble God's love for the world, then it has to be about how we serve another person by laying down our lives for them. That's how we've got the same kind of love as God had it. And that can only happen in marriage. You see, outside of the commitment to be true to someone in sickness or in health, no matter what they do to let you down, outside of that, sex has to be selfish. It's, it's about what I want. You know, if you have sex with someone who doesn't care about what's best for you, then no matter how passionate or pleasurable it might be, it's not nearly as much as what God wants for you. Imagine the poverty there to bear yourself, to be that close with someone and for them to see you and not love you, not want what's best for you. And Jesus says, if you want what's best for someone, then you want them to only give their body to someone who's committed to their mind and their soul as well. Now, hear this. In this passage, Jesus is not saying, you know, divorce is bad and, and sex outside of marriage is bad. And so if you did any of this, then you're bad. Jesus is not saying that. What Jesus says is, I want you to win. I want you to enjoy love in the fullest sense. I want your life to resemble my love for the world. And you can have it. This isn't a pipe dream. Friends, here's the irony here. Jesus says abundant life is totally possible, but it's not possible outside of laying your life down and following me. And Jesus is headed to the cross. So that's where we've got to go as well. We've got to have that kind of love for each other. To lay your life down, your desires. It's not about you, it's about the other. And this seems backwards. In our world, it's backwards. If in my marriage I'm laying my life down for my spouse, then I'm going to be miserable, right? Jesus wants me to be miserable. But Jesus says, try me. Right? Try sex and marriage my way. See what happens if you lay your life down to serve instead, tr instead of trying to get. See if this doesn't change you. I mean, imagine. Imagine how you might respond if your spouse started laying down their life and serving you like Jesus served the church. Imagine you were in a relationship like that. Could you imagine? Do you think that your heart might soften? No matter where you're at today, what you think about marriage today, 
Do you think that someone who is serving you like Christ served the church could soften you? Do you think that you might fall in love with that person or or fall in love again? Jesus thinks you might. In fact, he thinks if you were loved in that way, you could be totally transformed, miraculously transformed. He believes this so much that he put on skin and died to woo you to himself. So let his love transform you and then give it away. Friends, what do you think? Is Jesus wrong? Are his views on marriage and sex a, a pipe dream? Nothing, nothing more than some idea of rubbing Aladdin's lamp, getting some wishes? Or given his ability to raise people from the dead, might this be a miraculous possibility? Jesus says, bet on me. If you want to win in love, bet on me. If you want to win in marriage and sex, then give yourself to loving people the way I love you. Love your spouse that way. Commit yourself to use sex in the way that I say it works. If you really want to live, Pick up your cross and follow me. We're going to move into our time of communion today. And communion here is for people who see uh, what Jesus has done on their behalf. That he left heaven and that he put on skin and that he died in our place while we were yet sinners. While we were running the other way. Uh, The Old Testament, there's all these pictures about uh, God being the lover and, and Israel, God's people, being this adulterous woman who's, who's throwing herself at all these other things and God chases and chases and chases and longs to woo her back to himself. That's what God's done for each of us. Each and every one of us are like that woman, like Israel. We've run our own ways and Jesus has chased us down. All the way from heaven he's come. And he's done this so that we might fall in love with him. That's what he wants. And it's also then for people who want to live out their lives, so their relationships, their marriage, their sexuality. Uh, If you're not married yet, it it means something very, very specific about uh, saving this stuff for marriage. But if you are married, it means choosing to serve your spouse like Christ served the church. Communion is for people who say, I'm not just going to trust Jesus for my salvation. I'm going to trust him to be Lord in the areas of my marriage and my sexuality. Trust Jesus that he wants what's best for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good, good God and that you love us and that you want us to win. You don't want us to be miserable. You want us to win in the most important aspects of life. In our marriage, and our sexuality, you want us to win. And so come, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd awaken our hearts, even in this moment, that we would see you afresh and what you've done on our behalf, and that we would fall in love and respond by living our lives for your glory. We ask that you do this miracle in us. Woo us, win us to yourself, that we might fall in love with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys.